invited in two places like Tel Aviv. Great software. Seriously, that's all you got? Yeah. <laughs> You're ready. Do we want to get into that? You can use DNA. Boy, those robots have cool performance. Hello, my name is Vladimir Steinman. I'm from Get, formerly Get Taxi. I'll talk about uh, microservices failure resistance on Rails. Actually, I feel a bit old-fashioned talking about microservices in the end of 2016, but uh, otherwise I'll just have to talk about some other languages. So that's what we've got. Uh, two years ago, Get has started building microservices. That's uh, one of famous pictures. A bit changed. Um, back then we had a lot of issues related to stability. Accidental failures happened every other day. Oops, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so yeah, there are two main models for microservice interaction, REST and messaging. At GET we're using both models, but synchronous REST communication takes a bit higher uh, request rate. So for instance, 300,000 external resources are being requested synchronously every minute. And as I said before, we suffered a lot from failures. So I'll talk about things that helped us to increase system resistance to those accidental failures. The core of uh, RESTful communication is HTTP call, Ruby offers a vast variety of HTTP clients. This is from Ruby Toolbox. We're using REST client gem, which is a wrapper around NetHttp. I won't suggest you using anything related to NetHttp because at one of the conferences I've heard that it might, re it might be removed from Rails 4 by Bojidar. So better to get out of it as soon as possible. So what we were doing in our code was something like this. Looks pretty simple, REST client get some URL. Looks fine, but the problem is that the explicit timeouts are missing for this call. NetHttp has two timeout settings. One is called read timeout, another open timeout. Read timeout is for reading maximum time for reading a block out of socket. Open timeout is for opening the socket. So the default timeout for reading is 60 seconds and for open timeout it just doesn't exist. This is uh, some code from NetHttp library from Ruby standard, standard library. So you can imagine which value to use for read timeout based on your services response times but what actually to use for uh, opening the socket. Which value to use for opening the socket timeout. So it really depends on your network. I ran some simple benchmark. The number is weird because after this number I ran out of sockets. So as you can see, most of the time it takes less than one millisecond to open a socket, but sometimes you can get uh, values that are more than seconds. It might just stuck there. This is barely acceptable for the system under load, so you'd better keep this timeout pretty tight. And in case you get the timeout, just retry. Timeouts, they already got criticism today. If you don't know how it works, you should definitely look into it, especially if you're, look if especially if you're using persistent uh, connections. So that's some simulation of what might happen to Redis client, for example. We're setting some value, keys answer, value is 42, then measuring how much time it takes to get to read this value. Then applying timeout that is way less than the time needed for the operation to return. Then we're sending ping command to Redis, which usually should return pong string. But in fact, it's returning the result of previous operation because it was never read from the socket. So just take a look. Uh, setting timeouts is a necessity, obviously, but what to do if you're starting to get a lot of timeouts, your service is slowing down. So depending on the time that your system needs to scale up, it might worth to give some time for the degraded service. 
meaning just not sending more requests until it's back to life. And there's a pattern for that. It's called Circuit Breaker. Um, we're using implementation from the gem called Stoplight. Basically, the idea of a circuit breaker is that you wrap the call into some object that monitors for exceptions. And if the code's uh, failure rate is above certain threshold, you're just prohibiting the call. Here's an example using stoplight. So we're creating a stoplight object. The block is saying sleep one second and then throw some error. After we're running the code few times, so each run takes one second approximately. Then after the third time, the circuit is opening, or in terms of stoplight, it's uh, the color of the stoplight is switching from green to red. So when we run the code the third time, we actually straight away getting the result, which is an error. Not the error that we threw before, but the er red light error which basically means that we're just saving our waiting time for the system, which is good, but the problem that if we're not getting the data, we're, we can hardly proceed. So what to do if we didn't get the data? So we just started to cache things more extensively. We're using Redis with the Redis Rails gem. Redis Rails provides uh, implementations for a bunch of Redis stores for Rails also for a uh, cache model from the Rails active support. So we can do something like Rails cache fetch, some key, then you're passing the block. So how it works, if you don't know, first it looks up the key on the backend. If it finds it, on, in other words, on cache hit, it just returns the data. On cache miss, it runs the block, writes the value back to the backend, and returns the value. So the problem that you don't know what it will return. Basically, if you have some problems with Redis, so you for sure will get an error, which will just um, basically propagate up. And we didn't want that. We wanted to, for we wanted the cache to behave transparently. Just run the block if you if you got a timeout for, from Redis, for example. That's all right. But what happened when there's no more cache. This station is called Cache Stampede. Here is some illustration. Service, let's see if this works. Opa. So service requests are coming to service A. There is some cached resource from service B. So service A goes to cache, but the cache is expired. So now all the requests are navigated to service B. But this is a slow request. So during this moment, during this time, more requests are coming in, which finally might result in 502 from S Nginx on service B. And this will happen till the moment the first request to service B is coming back, which might take a while. So fortunately, Rails has a solution for that. Rails cache fetch uh, receives optional parameter calls called race condition TTL. Uh, the so how race condition TTL works um, when fetch uh, gets the stale data from Redis it just puts it back to Redis with a very small TTL then runs the block then writes it back to Redis with the normal TTL so the race time is just the matter of uh, matter of set into Redis and not the actual call to service the problem is that Redis Store doesn't have this feature for some reason. It's in Redis Active Support, but it's not implemented in the Redis Store. So we just added features that we we thought were missing in the Redis Store. Unfortunately, we still this we still owe this pull request to them. So far, it didn't take time to to make this pull request. Another question to consider is where to put cache. So usually cache is either local or remote. For local cache, we're using Redis, which is installed on machine. For remote, also Redis. The advantage of local Redis is that super fast because you're not spending time in network round trip. Also, you almost don't have connectivity issues. 
But the thing is that it really works great only if you have small key, uh, key space cardinality, if you have a big number of keys, so you're just getting a lot of cache misses. And now we came to the main staple of failure resistant distributed system, which is a concept of fallback. Basically, what to do when we didn't get the data, we didn't get the resource at a time when it was uh, when it was needed. Initially, this sounds that we can't really proceed, but in fact, some things they can be done. For example, we could use something which is called fallback cache, which is just regular cache but with a really long TTL. For example, one week. So if we were not able to fetch the resource, the actualized resource, then we can use this value. The idea is that serving somewhat stale is anyway better than just failing. The problem is that if you have a lot of different keys or you just can't cache, so you should be, uh, you should get, you should get uh, creative in order for fallback cache to work. For example, one of our services defines which classes, classes are like types of taxis, are available for a given coordinate. It doesn't make any sense to make cache here because there's no chance that somebody else will uh, order from exactly the same point. Fallback cache also be because of the same reason. So for the fallback, we're caching all the classes that were available in the area of square kilometer around which is, it might be not precise, but it's better than nothing. In case you just can't use any cache, so you could define some last resort method that will run any time that the resource is not available. For example, if we can't fetch driving distance from between two points from the open source routing machine, so we can just calculate the error distance, which is definitely better than failing command fallback. So before I was talking mostly about queries, commands, you can't cache it. So usually the synthetic fallback for command is uh, just to replace the command with some asynchronous retriable process with uh, some sort of non-linear uh, back off just to distribute requests and time. And also because the fact that you got a timeout from the other side, it doesn't necessarily mean that the operation didn't succeed there, so it's better for the operation to be the potent, so that when you will retry, you won't spoil anything. Initially, we thought that uh, entering the fallback scenario should be transparent for the system flow, but uh, soon it revealed that when it comes to money, uh, it's better to know what's the quality of data that you got. So it might be important to register the fallback fact on some relevant entities for their retroactive untangling. And given all this stuff, we've built something that we call the resource client, which is a middleware chain that wraps the actual network call into some middlewares, fallback middleware, cache, cache middleware, circuit breaker middleware, and like something about network. So this is the approximate flow, just we'll go over, this is approximate flow. So when requ external request comes in, we bypass fallback layer, entering cache layer, checking for resource cache. If it exists, then we just return the value. If it doesn't exist, then we go down to circuit breaker layer, checking what's the circuit status, if it's opened or closed. So if it's closed, then we're going to fallback, if it's open, then we're going to net going down to network, applying timeouts, going through network. Then if something is wrong with TCP connection, just retrying. Then going up, then we're counting the result of that operation for the circuit status. So if it's a failure, so it should be counted against failures. Then if it's enabled, we're caching the value that we got from network for resource cache, then going up. If, if there was a success, then we also cache for the fallback cache. If there was a problem, so we either check for fallback cache, if it's not enabled or it's a, it's a cache miss, so we're going up 
So it's synthetic fallback, which is just a method, and returning the value. We're monitoring our resource client with the new relic. So that's some graphs when things went the wrong way, when the service that I mentioned before was not had some timeout issues. So here we can see that one sec. Here we can see amount of requests that were timed out. So it resulted in circuit being opened with the time. And as we can see there, most of requests they got cache hit of a fallback cache. And just some of them they got synthetic fallback, which means that like no classes were available at that moment. So from the business standpoint it means that around three 3,000 clients were able to proceed with their order even though the service was not available. Unfortunately, from the sorry, from the simple call that we had before, we ended up with this um, monstrous spaghetti, I would call it. But it seems that there's no other way of building failure-resistant distributed system if you won't think about failures beforehand. So you need to be very explicit about your actions when, if the resource won't be available. And well, the last slide is just if you want to send your CVs, this is the address. Thank you.